This is The Red Line, where we speak to three expert witnesses on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. There is no one in the world, I believe, who understood Realpolitik better than Otto von Bismarck, first chancellor of the German Empire. He understood how to play countries against each other and how to manipulate the tangled web of relationships that is Europe predicting many of the crises both in his time and in ours. One of the many things he got right was that war will come of some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. And he was dead on. The First World War began from an assassination in what is now Bosnia and Herzegovina. That war going on to cause 40 million casualties. We almost saw war break out again after the death of Tito, the father of Yugoslavia when the entire Yugoslav nation entered into a huge ethnic war between Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Bosnians, Macedonians, and Albanians. That war going on to kill 130,000 people. But there's an aspect of that war we tend to forget. Whilst peace deals were made creating independent states like Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, there's one nation that didn't get that. Kosovo. To this day, Kosovo remains a part of Serbia, even though ethnically it's over 90% Albanians and has a little to no infrastructure between the Serbian capital Belgrade and the Kosovan capital Pristina. Since 2008, Kosovo has proclaimed independence from Belgrade, but Belgrade points to history to show that it has for a long time held dominion over Kosovo. This dispute not only sits along the new Cold War lines, with Moscow and Beijing supporting Belgrade, and Brussels supporting Pristina, but it could also be the key issue that Moscow needs to reassert itself in what it views as its own backyard. And to talk more about the roots of this conflict, we turn to our first guest. Part one, one more to go. It's uh, like a regular Eastern European city, really. So for anyone who was in any city of Eastern Europe, it wouldn't make, uh, any specific uh, difference. Um, there are a lot of socialist buildings, uh, a lot of new buildings, uh, but this is like this wave that you uh, would have seen in any maybe post-communist country. Uh, what is uh, a bit different, uh, but this is more if you look closely, is that there are a lot of young people. So the city is quite alive and quite vibrant there are a lot of cafes uh, people are spending a lot of time outside so it's very uh, yeah i think the best word would be very vibrant city maria ristish is the regional director for the balkan investigative reporting network she also writes for the balkan insight reporting democracy and is a fellow at the Freie university in berlin she also grew up in the balkans herself and she joins us today claim that serbia has uh, is a historic one. So it goes really into the Middle Ages and the period uh, that Ottomans were uh, in the Balkans. Um, and uh, in that uh, period, there was a famous Kosovo battle uh, where um, Slavs were fighting uh, Turks, basically, uh, or the Ottomans uh, in the 14th century. Uh, so... Uh, since then, there is a myth uh, that Kosovo is the cradle of Serbia, similar like uh, a lot of Jewish people would tell you for Jerusalem. So it's a similar type of uh, narrative that is the cradle of the Serbian culture, of the uh, modern Serbia uh, as well, and uh, that for that reason, um, this uh, should have been uh, the Serbian land uh, and through the history it was more or less not all the time part of uh, Serbia or part of the country that was run from Belgrade to be precise not to go too much into uh, history and uh, majority of Serbs or the nar dominant narrative in Serbia is uh, that uh, Serbs have right to this land uh, and the, the Albanians are always a minority or the intruders there. Although in reality, Albanians were 
more or less always majority uh, in that specific part of the country. This, of course, escalated during uh, the 90s, where a lot of violence uh, occurred and the actual uh, war uh, that Serbia has been running uh, from Belgrade with a name to completely ethnically cleanse um, the Albanian population from there. And at one point during the war, they actually did it. A lot of people were expelled. But uh, as the war ended, uh, Albanians uh, returned uh, and Serbs fled to uh, mostly to Serbia. So in a way, after 2000, it stayed uh, to be unrecognized uh, territory and administrated by uh, the United Nations. Uh, and at one point, um, Kosovo also declared independence that Serbia still opposes and still considers that um, Kosovo is part of Serbia, that it's still a province that it was uh, before the war. And what about Kosovo? What evidence do they put forward to back their independence claim? So for uh, Kosovo Albanians, uh, they considered themselves uh, as the first people who lived in the territory that is uh, today uh, Kosovo territory. So um, they also claim it historically uh, as well. Um, the other thing uh, is that they uh, claim that they were suppressed uh, during uh, most of the Yugoslav and Serbian ruling. So uh, we had different countries um, that were on the territory of Kosovo, uh, Yugoslavia, and then uh, Serbia and Albanians claimed that they were always uh, in a way suppressed nation and that their rights were more or less always uh, violated through this last century. Um, and in most of the cases that is uh, true, the most uh, extreme uh, case, I would say, is um, in the 90s, uh, where, um, as I mentioned, uh, our president, Slobodan Milosevic, run uh, quite uh, a heavy uh, campaign uh, towards uh, Kosovo Albanians. First, he expelled them from uh, official institutions. So they basically had parallel institutions uh, together with the Serbian one. Uh, they were not allowed to be uh, part of public life uh, and the discrimination was quite uh, huge. Uh, after that, uh, there was a period of uh, huge violence that escalated um, during the three months uh, of NATO bombing, where um, almost a million of Albanian was, Albanians was expelled and um, uh, a lot of them uh, were killed. Uh, and after that, as I said, uh, Albanians returned and they considered that um, because uh, their rights were so much violated uh, that they have basically uh, a right to self-determination, that they cannot be ruled uh, by Belgrade simply because that government was always uh, abusive towards the population there and that their right uh, to uh, have independent country uh, is legit. And for that cause, they were supported um, mostly by the most of the um, countries uh, of uh, the United Nations, at least the most powerful one. Um, so in that sense, uh, their claim was considered uh, legit and that um, allowed them to have Kosovo as independent country. So I know this would hang over the minds of every Kosovan every single day, but what about in Serbia? Is Kosovo still a big issue to the average Serb or is it just something brought up by certain politicians to stoke nationalism? More or less, uh, I think Kosovo in Serbia is a, some kind of a myth. Uh, so it's often used uh, as um, some kind of uh, mythical discussion around Serbian identity uh, and about our origin as Serbs. Uh, so it doesn't really resonate in real life of people. So it's more or less a thing that uh, politicians often use. Uh, because it creates certain emotions and people have unrealistic 
um, I would say, uh, comments around uh, Kosovo, but in reality, it's actually not at all uh, reflected in daily life. Like if you would ask a random person on the street or um, somewhere else, have you ever been to Kosovo or what do you think about Kosovo or have you ever met um, Kosovo Albanian, a lot of people would simply say no. Uh, and I don't think that in general in the past 20 years a lot of people actually traveled to Kosovo. So it's really like this irrational uh, thing. I don't know. It's uh, For me, it, it always reminded me of, I don't know, if you would ask an American Jew, uh, what do you think about Jerusalem? So he would probably tell you a lot of things, but whether he actually went to Jerusalem, no, he didn't. So it's really this um, emotional question that doesn't really reflect the daily life of people. So we can get a better understanding of this conflict, can you give us a brief summary on the 1999 Kosovan War for Independence against Serbia? So the violence started uh, in 1998. Uh, and uh, it was mostly uh, done by Serbian police uh, and uh, back then uh, a guerrilla group, uh, Kosovo Liberation Army. Uh, and the fighting was mostly between uh, them in certain villages uh, in Kosovo where uh, civilians were often targeted uh, as uh, victims of um, that violence. And in that case, it was uh, only the local police and uh, certain special troops from Belgrade. Then uh, there was an attempt to find a peaceful solution uh, internationally in France. Uh, but that never succeeded. So uh, because that didn't succeed and the violence continued by Serbia, NATO decided to intervene. Um, and during that intervention, which lasted uh, from end of March to June, uh, Serbia launched a heavy campaign uh, in Kosovo, which included mass murders, killings, torture, expulsion, um, enforced disappearance. Um, so in overall, uh, mostly Serbia participated, Serbian police and uh, Serbian army, but also uh, Montenegrin uh, police, because back then uh, Serbia and Montenegro were one country, Yugoslavia. Uh, and they fought uh, Kosovo Liberation Army, which was quite small. It was a guerrilla group, so uh, Serbia was always, always most, more powerful. Uh, and in that sense, uh, this fact that the Serbian had, Serbians had more army, uh, more people, uh, more arms, um, it is logical in a way uh, to, um, to say that the Albanians were a uh, bigger victim of uh, this uh, aggression. Uh, violence against Serbs also took place, but it was much on a smaller scale, uh, considering uh, that the Kosovo Liberation Army was quite uh, small comparing to what uh, Yugoslav Army had. And Yugoslav Army was in general quite powerful uh, because of the previous war uh, they had. Uh, it was always the biggest one in former Yugoslavia, uh, and it always had um, most of the arms, so to say. So after the Yugoslav war and then the Kosovan war and the American intervention to stop it, some modicum of peace returned to the region. But a lot of the scars are still there. Even today, almost two decades later, you can't easily travel from Belgrade to Pristina, and the two do not have direct rail lines between them either. There isn't even regularly scheduled domestic flights between the two. So for the average citizen, is it difficult to travel between Serbia and Kosovo? Uh, going from uh, Belgrade yeah, to Pristina or from Serbia to Kosovo, uh, it's not easy, uh, but it's also not so difficult. Um, you can go uh, by car uh, or you can go by bus. So um, when you arrive uh, to the border, um, there are a lot of documents that you need to have, especially if you're traveling from Kosovo to Serbia, simply because uh, Serbia uh, so far didn't recognize a lot of Kosovo documents. And this has been regulated through uh, the EU dialogue uh, that actually regulated in general freedom of movement. Uh, Kosovars have uh, their own passport, 
passport so they have their own documents basically um, Kosovo has every elements of a state from the institutions to the documents etc the issue is that Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo documents and other countries that obviously don't recognize Kosovo uh, documents uh, they don't accept uh, it so in that sense you can go to Serbia with a certain paper uh, but you cannot um, use passport uh, as uh, an official uh, document. And I know a lot of uh, friends from Kosovo have uh, often a lot of trouble uh, with that because the rules are um, not clear and they're quite arbitrary. So, uh, for example, at the airport, they will decide uh, that they will accept some documents and then the other day they will decide not to accept it. Uh, so it's very, uh, I would say, arbitrary, and for people who travel a lot, uh, it's often quite uh, a headache. So with 97 of the UN's 193 nations recognizing Kosovo, there is almost half the world that would not allow Kosovans entry due to their lack of travel documents. Is it like Transnistria, where most people carry a second passport, or do Kosovans just accept that in the current circumstances, that they will never be allowed entry into roughly half the world. Most of the Kosovars don't want to have a Serbian passport simply because for them uh, that means that they belong uh, to a state that was a repressor. Uh, so it's also a matter of pride and principle, uh, so to say, uh, even though that they are aware that uh, they would maybe get more benefits with the Serbian uh, passport, they don't want to do it simply because they don't want to be uh, part of, of Serbia in any way. Uh, and that means also not to have um, their uh, uh, passport. It's same with the language and any other basically aspect of life that connects them uh, with Serbia. People often refer to Kosovans as ethnically Albanian, being that the majority Muslim, and they follow a lot of the same cultural practices as Albania, mostly developed under their dual time under the Ottomans. This is in contrast to the Slavic-based and Eastern Orthodox following of the Serbian people. So ethnically, what would you call a Kosovan? Would you call them a Serb or an Albanian or even just a Kosovan? Uh, most of uh, the Kosovo Albanians are Albanians. So they would uh, say, uh, if you would ask them uh, who they are, they would say that they're Albanians. Uh, so in Kosovo, uh, two uh, nations, two nations yes that are um the biggest are the albanian nation and the other one is serbian uh only few people uh and this is mostly with this uh, new generation of people would uh, consider themselves kosovars uh, so this is quite a new uh phenomenon uh that this uh, liberal part of kosovo society is trying uh to push that for example all of them are Kosovars and the, doesn't matter whether they belong to Albanian uh, or uh, the Serbian uh, ethnic group. Um, but in general, most of them uh, are uh, Albanians by ethnicity, not nation, sorry, uh, and uh, they're quite close um, with uh, Albanians from Albania and Albanians from uh, North Macedonia. Uh, they're also quite associated with the flag. Uh, they considered uh, the Albanian flag uh, as a flag for the whole ethnic group, not just people living uh, in Albania. And uh, in general, like for example, the Kosovo flag, that's quite a new thing. Uh, although I think uh, it is in general uh, in usage in around uh, a bit more than 10 years. Uh, but still, most of the um, Kosovo Albanians associate them themselves with the flag uh, that represents um, Albanian state. Uh, and most of them would say that this is the flag of all Albanians. To break these problems, though, do you think the future for Kosovo is heading back towards Moscow? Or is it tightening the relationship with the European Union? Joining the EU is obviously... Uh the best option at the moment simply uh, because everything else uh, is only uh, I would say forcing the region to go into the more instability uh, poverty um, and in general uh, it leaves the region more 
open to different kind of uh, foreign influence. I mentioned uh, Turkey, but there is also Saudi Arabia, United um, Arab Emirates, there is also Russia, uh, China. So in a way, uh, European Union is uh, seen uh, still as um, something that will bring uh, democracy to the region, uh, something that will bring, bring strong institutions, uh, and something that will uh, actually uh, make uh, these states um, more, uh, I would say, resilient to uh, different kind of uh, conflicts or instability uh, attempts. Uh, and obviously, at the moment, there is nothing better than EU integration that is offered to um, Kosovo, but also to the whole region. The issue with the EU integration is uh, that this process is quite um, long and it's dragging uh, for years. Uh, for various uh, reasons, um, and uh, the EU um, also was changing strategies along the way, what should be their priorities, what uh, should be not, uh, etc. So um, now with the current crisis in European Union, from Brexit to uh, the pandemic, um, no one uh, seems to think that the Balkans is priority uh, for the European Union. And people obviously uh, feel that. Uh, and uh, a lot of people would say uh, that uh, European Union is just a dream uh, that will never become a reality. But also for a lot of people, this is the only thing that they can uh, hope for. Russia loves to use breakaway states as pressure points. Being able to demand things from a central government under threat of sending more money, weapons and arms to your breakaway republic and inflaming the situation. We see this in Moldova with Transnistria, Georgia with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Azerbaijan with Nagorno-Karabakh, in Ukraine with the Luhansk People's Republic, and now in Serbia with Kosovo. The only difference in Kosovo is that this time it's the West that's the one supporting the breakaway republic. But why? Why would the West be backing Kosovo in this conflict? And why does Russia use its UN P5 vote to prevent nationhood for the Kosovan people? Well, for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 2. Pandora's Box. Why is it important, you know, still, or should it be important for the EU? I mean, there are basically two reasons. One is... Um, <clears throat> It's on, in the periphery of the European Union. Um, it is part of Europe. Um, naturally, it should be in the European Union. So completing um, the unification of the European continent. Um, and then there is another reason is the reason history, you know, in, in, in the context of uh, the, let's say the 21st century post 89 world uh, geopolitics, um, the Balkans uh, has been an important chapter. Boro Weber is a senior associate of the Democratization Policy Council, concentrating on the Western Balkans. He also works as a political consultant for political foundations and organizations throughout Europe, and has had multiple appearances on news programs like Al Jazeera. And he joins us today. When 89 came and we had this illusions about the end of history, liberal democratic western countries and 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 and, and the model uh, would simply you know had succeeded and it would simply you know um um uh, spread globally there's no alternative anymore and uh, no no system to compete political system um that was very early you know that 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 ideal picture and that rosy idea of the 21st century of peace and democracy so what I want to know is, from a strategic point of view, why does Serbia want to hold on to Kosovo so badly? And why not let it go, you know, become more homogenous in Serbia whilst also diffusing one of the region's biggest flashpoints? Is there something I'm missing here? Well, actually, first of all, Serbia never has been an ethnically homogeneous country, even without Kosovo, it will not be, just, just as a side note. But... Uh, from a racial interest point of view, of course, this makes absolutely no sense. This is basically 
um, as you as you mentioned, I mean, um, if 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 Serbia and and Serbian politics would come from a rational angle, it would identify Kosovo a, a, as you know a remnant of the past, a burden, a political and geopolitical burden. But uh, why Serbia is not or has not been able by itself. Uh, but needs here really outside um, actors like the EU and the US to help them basically get rid of that burden. It sounds very undemocratic, but it really isn't. Um, is because of the role that Kosovo played um, in uh, for the last has played has played for the last three decades in Serbian politics. Uh, I mean, Kosovo was the point of you know where. Um, the Kosovo, the, the Kosovo crisis at the beginning of the 1980s um, simply was the starting point of the ethnicized uh, violent breakup of Yugoslavia, not because of Kosovo as such, but because the Kosovo issue that normally would have been solved within the socialist Yugoslav system, there, there was a systemic problem there. It needed some adjustment. The Yugoslav socialist system um, for its very specific nature, very different from the Soviet socialist system, had one great quality that was adjusting to realities, finding some pragmatic solutions for some structural problems that the Soviet socialist system did not find. The fact that this did not happen here simply showed, you know, that that uh, the systemic crisis had been so the structural crisis so deep of the Yugoslav socialism, just like the Soviet socialist systems in the Eastern Bloc in the 80s, that uh, there simply was not was not able to solve it within the system. And that's why, you know, this was the, the starting point of the breakup, break not the reason. Um, and from then on, um, and with the rise of Milosevic, and again, we won't go into the history really deeply, there's one constant in Serbia's Kosovo politics from the early days of, of Milosevic. Uh, Kosovo from the beginning, um, based on this ideological construct of the Kosovo myth, a very heavily, heavily Serbia, so-called, um, a nationalist myth uh, going back to the 1990s, the beginning of the rise of modern nationalism in, in, in the Balkans and in Serbia, has been a political means and not an ins end by itself. So Kosovo from the beginning had been used by Milosevic as, as a means uh, to try to, to change internal relations inside Yugoslavia. It led him unintendedly uh, to be the main driving force of the breakup, ethnicized violent breakup of Yugoslavia. But the constant really may remained in Serbian politics that you have a complete um, wide gap between, you know, the narrative, which is a very, very nationalist, uh, very uh, mythic, the Kosovo move, and the reality, which had nothing to do with it, and the reality being, as you pointed out, there, there's a huge 90, 94% Albanian population majority. So that policy that always was not a policy about Kosovo, but a, a, a policy using Kosovo as a means, never had a, 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 an, a, a, an objective solution. It never even asked for a solution or looked for a solution for the Kosovo structural problem. Um, it insisted, you know, ideologically, officially, that Kosovo has to re be, remain um, in Serbia. But basically, you know, this was an idea of the territory of Kosovo. Serbian politics never had a real politic answer to if you want to keep Kosovo, uh, how do you uh, you have an answer to integrate uh, this two million Albanians? So that's why, you know, this this uh, throughout these decades, throughout the 1990s, Kosovo was always a means. It was also then instrumentalized to control Kosovo. Sometimes in elections when Milosevic uh, wanted to use it, um, the Albanians were officially, you know, on the voters list. Sometimes when he did, needed it differently, they were not. So it was completely entirely instrumental. So when the, the whole Milosevic era ended and the so-called democratic forces came to, to power, their problem basically was, you know, in all international neg negotiations, this uh, whatever you know, whether nationalist or uh, democratic uh, political elites, former 1990s opposition, they were still in this tradition. You know, they wanted to keep the virtual Kosovo, but had no offer in any peace talks, uh, status negotiation, mediation talks by the West. Uh, hadn't had any answer or offer for, for the real the real Kosovo. They had never any um, solution for for the Albanian majority population. That's why you know all the previous efforts before the so-called political dialogue of, of the EU um, 
uh, which were all settings of classical, you know, conflict mediation uh, talks. So we let's find, you know, a compromise somewhere in the middle. They failed and they uh, had to fail because of this Serbia policy. So um, that's why, you know, when this conflict broke out, some political leaders in the EU took leadership like German Chancellor Merkel and said, you know, this cannot be. Serbia wants to get into the EU. And at the same time, they insist they, they want to keep Kosovo, which they don't they, they don't have, you know. So that's why, you know, since 2011 or 2012, 13, we have this political dialogue, which basically um, is from the EU or the Western outside telling Serbia, you know, OK, let's get real. You want to become a member of the EU. You know that Kosovo is gone. Uh, um, so if you want to become a member of the EU, uh, accept reality. Accept reality that you have lost Kosovo, what you anyway know for a decade. And you know that nobody is more to blame for having lost Kosovo than you yourself. And that's really the reality since independence that from the very, very far right to the very left um, in Serbia and political elites in Serbia, A, they know that Kosovo is gone and B, they know that there's nobody more to blame than themselves. That's basically what happened when the West started to talk, you know, Frank Turk, when in 2011, the German Chancellor said, you know, the time of border changes is over in, in, in the Balkans. You want to become a member of the EU and face reality. That we know at the beginning of this political dialogue, 2012, 13, when the first April agreement was signed, then you could hear uh, highest level uh, government officials in Serbia and in, 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 in the public arena and media giving interviews, talking uh, uh, really this real politic talk. Then Prime Minister Rita Dacic in 2013 gave a, uh, gave a, a landmark interview um, to some local media saying, you know, where there's been a taboo on Kosovo for a decade. We've lied to ourselves that Kosovo is ours. We lost Kosovo. There's only one way this, theoretically to uh, return Kosovo. That would be on tanks. But let's get real. Nobody in this country is prepared to do this. So let's let's then, you know, get uh, do a, a real politic based policy, accept the reality and maybe, uh, you know, do these agreements in the with Kosovo, normalized relations and, and, and get some safeguards so that Kosovo serve minority in Kosovo. Uh, has guarantees for her for being able to lead a normal life. So there's a lot of solutions on the table for this one, but many of these ones I don't actually think would work. But the first and most obvious one is a repeat of 1999 and a reinvasion of Kosovo by the Serbian army. We know the Russians have been selling large amounts of discounted arms to Belgrade for a while now, but do you think an invasion would actually be successful or is there even the national will to go for a bloody engagement with Kosovo these days? Well, you know, first of all, um, I mean, uh, one thing is simply militarily. I mean, there's not much left of the Serbian army, despite the recent purchase purchase of some Russian um, uh, military equipment. Second, um, they they definitely wouldn't be able to keep it because you know there there are two million Albanians. One thing is if you move in somewhere. Second is how do you keep keep some territory. And third is um, I mean today nobody's ready to fight you. I mean this this nationalist talk is one thing you know, uh, but the other reality is you would wouldn't find anybody in Serbia seriously uh, willing uh, um, uh, to go to the army and and fight in Kosovo. Moscow used to have a large influence in this region of the world, and Belgrade still regularly works with Moscow on projects. But ever since the end of the Cold War, Moscow has nowhere near the sway it once had over the Balkans. Uh, do you think Russia is involving itself more and more into this conflict in a hope to claw back some of the power it once had, or that it's just a delaying tactic, with Russia already resigned to the fact that nations like Bosnia and Kosovo will eventually join NATO? Well, you know, I mean, I think there are two important aspects here when it comes to the role of Russia in the in the Balkan region. And there again, there is a constant there from the 1990s. One thing is you have a, a kind of return of Russia to the Balkans in the last 10, 15 years. The other element is, um, and this was already in the 1990s um, and the experience of the West, first is Russia does not have a genuine strategic interest in the Balkan region. There is no real strategic interest in the region as such. It hasn't been in the 90s under Yeltsin. Um, it isn't even there now. Um, and uh, and the, the second lesson already in the 90s was 
whenever the West um, is most successful in the region if it just does uh, pursue its policy and ignores Russia. Um, that was the lesson we learned in the 90s. That, of course, was easier uh, when they were before Putin. It's not. It's a, it's a bit, a little bit more, you know, challenging since Putin is, is in power. But, um, you know, um, trying to include Russia and integrate them into any decisions would be absolutely wrong because it just helps, you know, um, elevate Russian relevance in the region. Because, you know, if 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 this is, I mean, this is as I said, this is part of Europe. Um, it's naturally the region should be part of, of the EU. It should be within Euro Atlantic integration is a natural, you know, direction for the Western Balkan region. Um, there is no genuineness, e even not by Serbia, to ever join any Euro Eurasian um, um, association or whatever. Um, so I mean, even outside, you know, the rhetoric and the sentiment. If you ask, um, if you do polls, and there are many polls about who is your uh, closest, you know, cooperation partner, even economically in Serbia, uh, two thirds will say Russia, and then only the EU. While the, Rus the Russian trade exchange with Serbia is minimal compared to the EU. So, I mean, apart from you know perce public perception and generally you know nostalgia, uh, when it comes to reality, you know, in, in Serbia, just like with, with, with the case with Kosovo. Um, Basically, there are only two options uh, geopolitically and, 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 and the wider policy for Serbia. It's either EU integration or isolation. There is no interest for both ends to be part of any, any, any you know, Russian fear. Um, so that's more on a general level. And do you think the Russian influence in the region is on the rise or is going to continue being on the decline in uh, the Western Balkans? The problem that we have, we have nevertheless in the last 15 years, we have a kind of return of Russia. But that return is, is, a, is not because of Russian, uh, you know, reinforced interest or reinforced engagement. It's, it's a product of a vacuum created by the West since 2005. So, so there's a vacuum in which Russia jumped into. And what they are doing in the Balkans is... Uh, they are enlarging their geopolitical relevance by playing the, the spoiler in the region. Um, not even a low cost, but even a no cost spoiler. So let's say, for example, when we shifted policy from post war half protectorate uh, state building policy in post war Bosnia uh, to a hands off policy in 2005. Um, and, and the policy that did not work were policy of e-integration, handing over responsibility to the local domestic elites for geopolitical, not for local reasons. When it comes to the Kosovo issue, you know, um, Russia again has no genuine interest. I mean, when Serbia rejected the Atisari plan on, on, on a settlement of the status dispute in 2007, um, Serbia rejected the plan because of its virtual Kosovo policy and Russia it simply went along you know with Serbia because that you know gives Serbia gives Russia by supporting uh, the resistance against the independence of Kosovo Russia keeps its influence in Serbia um, and uh, immediately in the context of the independence of Kosovo and Serbian Russian support for Serbia's rejection of the independence they made a, n a number of um, energy deals which were very, very unfavorable for Serbia for, for a decade and a half to come, really half colonial relationship. So, you know, the, from that you see really that um, this is not, you know, about genuine strategic interest. This is really about, you know, um, um, enlarging your uh, uh, international relevance and impact uh, through, you know, instrumentalizing some um, Slavic Brotherhood sentiments in the Balkans. That's why, you know, Russia is really in favor of status quo, because as long as the Kosovo status uh, dispute is not settled, um, Serbia has a reason, you know, to balance between Russia and the EU, Russia and the West. As soon as the status dispute is settled, um, Russia and, the, and, and Serbia will have a problem, you know, because that, that's something that in the context of the current negotiations over final agreement between Kosovo, which has these hot topics included, um, question of recognition of uh, um, Kosovo by Serbia, then the question of, you know, ending Serbia's blockage of EU and UN membership uh, for Kosovo. You know, if it comes to that step, which is not impossible, 
um, if the EU gets serious again these days, then you know you will have a situation where okay, if Serbia recognizes Kosovo, um, then you need to get to the UN, um, uh, you know, Security Council, and then then you know it's it's a kind of you know a showtime um, because then uh, either you know um, if Russia you know recognizes Kosovo, it cannot instrumentalize it anymore for their policy in other parts of the world, like you know let's say on Ukraine or Crimea. Uh, and if it doesn't accept, you know, if it's more, as they say, more Serbian than Serbia, then they will ultimately, you know, have to show that, you know, that the genuine Serbian national interests and Russian national interests are not one. A big chunk of the ethnic tensions here come from the fringes of Kosovo itself. For instance, Mitrovica, an important city in the north of Kosovo, is actually majority Serbian. And the Prasavo Valley in the south of Serbia is majority Kosovan. A little while ago, Trump talked about doing a deal to resolve these disputes once and for all through a land swap deal, giving the Kosovar areas to Kosovo and the Serbian areas to Serbia. The aim of which would be to remove the tension points and make both nations more homogenous. Uh, but do you think that's a wise deal? Or do you think redrawing the borders in the Balkans might open up new disputes in Serbia, Bosnia, North Macedonia and Croatia? who might all want to also take a look at their own borders and seize the opportunity to reassess things as they are. Yeah, that would open Pandora's box. I mean, it would not only open Pandora's box, it would um, totally, you know, make a mockery of the principles of the West's policy of three decades and somehow bringing back stability and, and, you know, peace to the region. And the very fact, you know, that we had three years uh, the first three years in this so-called negotiations on a, on a final comprehensive agreement between the EU's chief foreign and security policy uh, foreign and security policy chief, chief former chief negotiator in these negotiations, Federica Modigarini, siding and basically privatizing these negotiations, shielding them away from the member states, and basically building a troika with the two presidents. Um, including the Kosovan president, Hashim Thaci, who, because of his fear of uh, being tried by the specialist court in The Hague for war crimes, also privatized these negotiations uh, with President Vucic from Serbia, trying to carve out such a dirty deal in complete uh, secrecy on land swap, returning to the logic of the 1990s for their very private reasons, shows how deep, you know, in, in crisis uh, EU and the West, and then getting some support from the Trump administration on top of this, um, how deep the crisis of the of the West is that, you know, on something, as I said earlier, where in 2013, within the framework of this dialogue, we basically already had Serbia there, it, you know, to make that step um, towards recognizing the reality that Kosovo is gone and, and even seeing, you know, that this is um, uh, beneficial for them. And everything else is just regressive. That this uh, slipped back in, into such such an idea. Um, thanks God, this idea has been stopped because uh, within the EU, Germany persistently resisted it. Major publicly, majority of EU member states also resisted it, though most of them not having become vocal. Even some of the non-recognizing member states, like like Spain, their former foreign minister and now current EU foreign policy chief, Mr. Burrell, publicly resisting it. So, I mean, that idea has been stopped. And that's why we currently have a kind of reset of these negotiations in which obviously and thankfully um, um, even the new EU special representative just appointed post in April this year for these negotiations has clearly said that this, um, as this is resisted by the majority of member states, this is not part of the negotiations anymore. Uh, this is the local political elites um, seeing, you know, the weakness and the crisis of the West and trying to capitalize it for some policies that are even for the stability of their countries completely uh, poisonous. So that's, yeah, so in, in that sense, you know, this would not only as a principle, but also as a single that, you know, all the rules, uh, all the red lines that have been established by the West to stabilize this region after the 1990s Balkan Wars, that, that there are no rules anymore, no red lines, no principles enforced by the West, uh, anything goes. That was basically the, the, the land swap negotiation um, episode was a lesson learned that in parts of the West with the, with the weakening of liberal democracy, with the rise of populisms, 
um, we have a situation of, you know, where there are no more principles, no more values, no more liberal democratic values. So that's, you know, that's what would make it even more dangerous than the very idea. And that's why it is not important whether you, you know, swap three villages or four municipalities. It's just the very idea of ethno-territorialization, which led to the bloody Balkans wars on the one side and on the other side, lessons from that learned by uh, all kinds of political actors in the Balkans. That's something that had become part of the history, thanks to you know the intervention of the West in the 1990s in the Balkans, that this is back on the menu because there are no more rules. So that's why, why really, you know, if, if one would have gone to that dangerous idea, it would have really opened Pandora's box and we would have the region going up in flames again. Yeah. In June 1999, during the later days of the Kosovan War, the Russian Special Forces occupied the international airport in Pristina. At the same time, a column of NATO vehicles arrived in the foothills overlooking the airport. American and British tanks facing off against their Russian counterparts less than a decade after the end of the Soviet Union. American commander Wesley Clark ordered the NATO forces to go through the Russians and opened fire on the Russian special forces occupying the airport. It was only Mike Jackson, a British commander, who stood in the way and refused to carry out the orders. It's widely regarded that if Clark's orders had been carried out that day, it would have meant full-scale war between NATO and the Russians, and Bismarck would have been right again. Some damn fool in the Balkans. The Balkans acts as a powder keg, because it serves as not only a border between Europe and the Middle East, but also as a hammer to strike into the flank of the always contested European plain. Hitler knew he needed to capture the Western Balkans to protect his southern flank, and Stalin put it as a priority to capture before Berlin for the same reasons. This region has monumental importance to the entire EU, and its stability should be one that Brussels views as one of its most important objectives. So what are the EU doing to integrate the region both in Kosovo and its surrounding Balkan neighbours? And will it be enough to stop the Balkans backsliding into ethnic tensions and bloody conflict, much of which will very likely spill over once again into Central Europe? Well, for that, we have to turn to our third guest. Part 3. No Good Options I guess it's a historical uh, issue, it's a sentimental issue, um, it's most of all a political issue, because uh, if you ask regular Serbs, if you ask them, if you ask them, let's say, five years ago, they would probably tell you that Kosovo was not uh, number one or number five priority, it was much further down uh, on the list of priorities. Uh, they cared much more about jobs and economy uh, and so on. Um, this, however, changes easily when uh, the ruling politicians decide to, to take uh, this issue uh, on, on their political agenda and to, to use it to mobilize uh, their electorate. Vesela Cheneva is the Deputy Director for the European Council on Foreign Affairs, as well as the head of the ECFR's Bulgaria office. She is also a former spokesman for the Bulgarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and an expert on all things Southern Europe. And she joins us today. Regionally, it has uh, become a very contagious issue uh, for reasons that have to do with a very mixed um, ethnic picture in the Balkans. Uh, but, you know, um, looking objectively at uh, um, Serbian interests, uh, one would rather say that uh, Serbia should be trying to get into the EU as quickly as possible and not be a hostage of things that have happened more than 600 years ago. The nation of Montenegro was also once a part of Serbia as well. In fact, the Montenegrins are much closer to the Serbs ethnically than the Kosovans ever were. At the time of independence, Montenegro was also Serbia's only access to the sea, something much more important strategically than the terrain in Kosovo could ever offer. 
So why would Serbia let Montenegro leave relatively painlessly, but dig its feet in when it comes to Kosovo? I think back then, uh, Montenegro uh, kind of chose probably the right moment in time. Uh, the whole region was on the verge of starting uh, talks with the EU. Uh, Serbia was hopeful that it would uh, bridge uh, quickly this transition in the post uh, Milosevic era. And, uh, uh, and I think this was the moment when uh, Montenegro kind of produced a very successful campaign and uh, succeeded to uh, to demarcate uh, its borders from from those of Serbia, uh, I'm saying this in in symbolic terms because for many um, Montenegro is very close uh, culturally and historically to Serbia, much closer than uh, the Albanians inhabited uh, Kosovo. On the other hand, um, Kosovo seems to be the last. Uh, peace, so to say, of, of territory uh, that wants to get away from the former Yugoslavia. And I think for Serbia, it's much more than just uh, the history of, uh, of the battle of, uh, uh, of the Kosovo field in, in 1389. It's, it's actually um, also about its... Uh, its growing sense of uh, becoming smaller, um, its population growing older, um, and in general drifting away uh, uh, from from Europe. And I think um, this is a is a more complex issue from that point of view. Um, and this is why whoever decides to go for a solution of the Serbia Kosovo issue. Uh, will have to have something to offer to the Serbian uh, voters, which would be, you know, promising enough uh, so that uh, one can change this negative kind of uh, narrative and dynamic. So to get off the table, do you think there's a military solution to this conflict? This would be a very uh, stupid military adventure. Um uh, what I would say is there is K4 still in Kosovo. This is the NATO force uh, that uh, has uh, quite significant, uh, uh, cap- not, not only significant presence, but quite significant capabilities uh, that can be mobilized within a very short time frame. And frankly, I'm not sure that uh, any Serb really is willing to die for Kosovo. And here is when where Russians come in uh, to come back to your question. Very often they uh, instrumentalize um, dissatisfaction from the West. Uh, they uh, come into the openings left uh, from the West and uh, and make use of people's frustrations, of people's fears, uh, and uh, present themselves as a viable or t- alternative. Uh, which in most cases they're not, uh, not militarily, not economically, but, uh, but still I think uh, in the Serbian case, uh, Russia sounds like an attractive partner to have because of its uh, UN seat and the fact that Russia can uh, block any attempt to, uh, to get Kosovo into the international system. So if the lid comes off and the border swaps were to start and the Balkan nations go back to fighting each other, do you think the US would be willing to get involved in a second Balkan war? I am very doubtful that uh, a Trump administration would be willing to go uh, into the Balkans militarily, uh, not only because they have been extremely isolationist and self-centered, but also because... uh, Look, this is uh, Clinton land, uh, right? I don't see much sympathy in in Trump for uh, for doing much on the Balkans, is except for any quick deal uh, that c- could deliver him a photo op and uh, and probably the track record of at least one foreign policy success. 
Roughly half of the world's nations recognize Kosovan independence. And that half contains your usual suspects like the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, Mexico. But the half that doesn't support independence contains, you know, Russia and China, but also a few nations that are usually on the American side on debates like this. Nations like Greece, Romania, Spain, Slovakia, and Cyprus, all EU nations. Why would these countries be against an independent Kosovo? Okay, so there are four countries um, next to Spain which uh, don't recognize the independence of Kosovo. These are Greece, Cyprus, Slovakia, and Romania. And all of them have uh, very similar motives why uh, they do this. Uh, because they say uh, self-determination is not enough for independence. Uh, in legal terms, there needs to be an international legally binding agreement, which would then set off kind of the establishing of uh, an independent state. Because uh, for Spain, it's clear the reason is uh, Catalonia, uh, they're uh, afraid that uh, the, the province may, you know, vote in a referendum and uh, go independent. For Cyprus, it's about the whole island of Cyprus, which is divided in two. Uh, Greece supports Cyprus in this. Uh, and for Romania, it's also, and for Slovakia, there, there are bits of, with uh, different ethnicities uh, in, in their territories, which they're afraid uh, that may go, uh, you know, this, down the same route. But the fact is that um, all those five recognizers uh, have different policies towards Kosovo. Russia's permanent veto powers in the United Nations is going to be one of the huge stumbling blocks when it comes to finally getting independence for Kosovo. Is there anything that Kosovo or the West could offer Russia to change their vote on this issue? I think there are several uh, uh, aspects to this. Um, first of all, um, I don't see why Russia would be interested in resolving this particular one uh, because uh, the Kosovo-Serbia spat uh, or problem um, opens up space for Russia to have uh, to to maintain its its leverage over Serbia. Um, you know, if the Kosovo issue were to be resolved, uh, there would be much less uh, importance uh, that that Russia would bear. Economically, Serbia's future likely lies with the European Union rather than with Moscow. So, if the EU were to offer Belgrade EU citizenship tomorrow. Do you think they would be willing to forfeit Kosovo to attain that? Right now, Serbs don't believe that the EU membership tomorrow is possible. And frankly, they are right. Speaking about EU enlargement right now is extremely difficult. And it's not only about France. It's also about the Netherlands. It's about Denmark, even about Austria and, and probably even Finland. And so um, I think the skepticism of this of the serbian uh, society is uh, is quite justified unfortunately and so europe's promise uh, is uh, quite vague which makes uh, the resolution of the kosovo issue um, even though it's urgent and even though it would help serbian kosovo get go their own ways and develop uh, and and you know be free from each other. Still, the direct connection with the EU membership uh, does not work at this moment. One country we haven't mentioned yet is China, who also opposes Kosovan independence, but has been investing a lot of money into the Balkan region recently, especially in countries like Greece, Serbia, and North Macedonia. So, what is China's strategic goals when investing in the Balkans? China is going to try and blur the difference between EU and non-EU member states by, uh, for instance, connecting Serbia and Hungary uh, via railway. And that would allow it to enter the European market more easily and with less constraints. At least this is the Chinese uh, plan, I think. 
now with the with the big uh, game, <laughs> the global game, uh, becoming much more confrontational uh, between the U.S. and China, but also with Europe being in a precarious position, um, the role of the Balkans uh, in this may actually become bigger. And, uh, and, and here, again, it's not only about economy and infrastructure. The Chinese are coming into the media. Uh, they're starting slowly to use, so to say, kind of uh, propaganda instruments we saw this with the uh, diplomacy of masks throughout the first months of the corona crisis. Um, Serbian President Vucic posting these huge posters in the middle of Belgrade. Thank you, Brother C. Um, this uh, kind of uh, expanding influence uh, of, of China is... Uh, uh, f for me, is more strategic than it's just opportunistic. Kosovars view themselves as ethnically Albanian and have quite good ties with the government in Tirana. As a backup option to go around the UN problem, could Kosovo vote to, instead of becoming independent, just become the newest province of Albania? And if so, do you think the Albanians would go for that option? Um, the Albanian Prime Minister, Mr. Edi Rama, has been... Uh, uh, very active on uh, kind of the Albanian Kosovo bilateral track. Um, he has been visiting Kosovo a lot. He has uh, been making the point of inviting Kosovars to serve as ministers in his uh, cabinet. And uh, there are also a lot of uh, the removal of a lot of regulations between the two countries. Uh, and yet, uh, politically, there is uh, a lot of tension. Um, I think uh, Kosovars are very proud of their um, newly won uh, independence. And it will be probably uh, uh, difficult for them uh, to give it up just like this. I think this would be possible only uh, in case uh, the... Uh, uh, UN seat for Kosovo uh, becomes uh, an impossible dream. Only then, I think, uh, Kosovars will seriously uh, start thinking about uh, unification with Albania. The road to Kosovan independence is long and full of brick walls. It can't stay with Serbia because the memories of Serbian tanks rolling through cities and killing civilians is too fresh in everyone's mind. Even when it comes to having Serbian travel documents that would open up half the world to Kosovans, it's still too much for them. It makes them once again dependent on a nation that openly slaughtered them. As a Kosovan, you also know that having Serbs in your country and Kosovans in Serbia will just give your enemy someone to bully and use as a political prop when running their nationalist campaigns. It's a problem that won't go away. But who can Kosovo turn to? Russia is fervently defending its Slavic brothers in Belgrade, and their strategy is to simply use you as fuel for starting another Balkan fire. Any help at this point offered by Moscow should always be taken with a grain of salt. Well, can you turn to the Americans? Well, they haven't been focused on this region in a very long time and the proposals of land swaps is the opening of a Pandora's box. If you change the borders in Kosovo and Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, and North Macedonia will want to do the same. And those negotiations have very little chance of remaining peaceful. So those ethnic pockets will always remain a problem in your country. But that's still better than the US's plan. What about a backdoor option? What about a vote to be absorbed by Albania and join your ethnic brothers? But after two decades of hard fighting and slogging for independence, would you really want to give that all up to be ruled by a city far to the south rather than being ruled from a city far to the north? So you turn to the EU, but they won't help you either because if Kosovo manages to break away and easily join the EU, it will send signals to places like Catalonia in Spain Northern Cyprus in Cyprus, and Transylvania in Romania that they might be able to do the same. So the EU is unlikely to offer you much help, even though that they are your biggest trading partner, 
and everybody knows that an unstable Balkans will cause havoc throughout the EU as well. But even if you go above the EU, to the United Nations itself, you know that anybody with an independence-seeking province will vote against you. And two members of the Permanent Security Council, both Russia and China, will use their permanent veto powers to prevent it. There is no help for the Kosovans, and every path seems to end in a brick wall. But then again, going back to your old masters in Belgrade seems even worse than that. At present, there is no easy solution on the table, but nothing is ever permanent in this area of the world. All we hope for is that the Kosovans can eventually find a place to live peacefully in a region known for wars. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. So many people tuned in last week for our piece on the Libyan Civil War, and it's been absolutely amazing to read some of the DMs and messages from you guys. If you want to follow the show, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram on at the Red Line Pod, or you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Kelly at Oz. This show would not be possible without the amazing support from our great Patreons. Their donations help us find editors, researchers, and transcribers to help grow the show. If you think this fortnightly content is worth a couple of bucks a month, we would greatly appreciate it, as every dollar goes right back into the show. We're saving up money at the moment to be able to turn these episodes into full video clips with maps, graphics, and even war footage. But that would take us hiring an extra person to be able to do all that work, as we're already pretty stretched for time. So if you would like to see these as videos, we would greatly appreciate your donation. A huge thanks goes out to all of our guests this week. You can follow Maria Richtig and her amazing work with the Balkans Investigative Reporting Network on Twitter at Marianne underscore R. She does some of the best on the ground reporting in the region and I highly recommend you check out her show. Bodo was amazing to have on the program. He appears on almost every single panel that talks about this subject and it's rare to find someone who has a better grasp of the Balkans region than Bodo himself. You can find his amazing work with the democratization policy on Twitter at DPC underscore global. Valesa Chilneva is at the top of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a think tank we quote, read, and work with frequently. Every guest they put forward is always top notch, and Vesela was no different. Hopefully, we'll have her back on the show soon, but until then, you can follow her great work on Twitter at VT Chilneva. Once again, we have to give credit to Mark Spencer, who provides the vocals for these episodes that aren't mine. Mark has been an amazing friend of the show, and we are very lucky to have him on board. The topic for this episode actually came as a suggestion from one of our followers on Reddit. It was a great topic and we really did enjoy looking into this one. So if you would like to also suggest a topic for us, feel free to DM the show or myself personally on Twitter and we are always happy to chat, take suggestions or even answer questions you might have about the show. Until then, thank you once again for listening to the program. It really does mean a huge amount to me personally and everyone else here who works at the show. We'll be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night.